beautiful, mysterious, unique. Islands are worlds of their own. Places apart where life has evolved differently. But in our modern interconnected world, islands are also part of a global community that is changing, for better or for worse. In this series, we're exploring the lives of islanders. We're discovering that no matter how distant they are from the mainland, how distinctive their histories, or how proud they are of their independence, islands can't separate their futures from the fate of humanity as a whole. In so many ways, these shores are the front line of global change. What happens here matters to us all. Sitting in the eastern Mediterranean is the beautiful island of Cyprus. Kilometers of glittering coastline. Hundreds of hectares of broad, fertile plains set against a backdrop of dramatic mountain ranges. For visitor and resident, this could be paradise. But if Cyprus has been blessed by its geography, many would say it's been cursed by its location. At a key maritime crossroads between Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, the island has always been a stepping stone for marauding armies. Each time the people of Cyprus have been caught in the swell, forced to change their identity, pledge new allegiances. But the bloodshed isn't all ancient history. In 1974, the battle lines were drawn again. This time, Cyprus's twin populations of Greek and Turkish people were pitted against each other. The violence left deep scars on the landscape of the island and the psyche of the islanders. Today, Cyprus is divided. North against South, Muslim against Orthodox, Turkish against Greek. But there are those who aspire to a new future where Cyprus can be whole once more. Can they bring harmony to a divided island? Cyprus is an ancient land of myth and romance. Its patron is Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love and beauty. Legend has it she was born here, at Petra Toromio on the island's southern coast, rising from the sea on a giant shell. Her miraculous birth is marked by a feature that still dominates this famous beach, Aphrodite's rock. The story goes that if anyone manages to swim three times around her rock, the goddess will bestow on them perpetual beauty. 
Now the myth is used as a marketing ploy to attract holidaymakers to the island. And with 340 days of annual sunshine, the tourists arrive in their droves. Two and a half million every year. Some come for the classical history and the ancient ruins. Others for an entirely different experience. Cyprus has become the clubbing capital of the Eastern Mediterranean. Sleepy fishing villages like Ayanapa and Paphos now pulse with a new beat. But the island's appeal to the beautiful people is nothing new. In the 1960s, before mass market tourism, the seaside city of Famagusta was playground to the rich and famous. The stars all holidayed here. Bridget Bardo, Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton. But in 1974, the golden days came to an abrupt end. What happened here was no slow decline. It was a sudden and bloody conflict. When a Greek military coup tried to unite Cyprus with Greece, Famagusta was caught in the crossfire. Determined to protect its people and its interests, Turkey responded with force. An emergency evacuation was completed just hours before the Turkish and Greek armies met in combat on the streets of Famagusta. Greek Cypriots fled south. Turkish Cypriots escaped to the north. By the time a ceasefire was negotiated, Turkey had taken control of the northern third of the island. The United Nations set up a buffer zone between the two sides. Known as the Green Line, it's now a permanent divide across the whole island. To the south, the Republic of Cyprus is Greek Cypriot. It's part of the European Union and is recognized internationally. To the north is the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. No country except Turkey recognizes its sovereignty. Famagusta is now part of the Turkish North. Today, it's not the city's beaches, but the buffer zone itself that attracts visitors. They gaze from a distance at buildings abandoned since the conflict. The old tourist quarter, trapped in the no-man's land that cuts Cyprus in two. These signs of sudden departure still lie untouched. Four decades later, there is little hope that the residents might return to take up their interrupted lives. Greek Cypriot farmer Andreas Hatziaros is one of those who's been displaced. His home village of Achna is trapped in the buffer zone, a mirage in the distance. Just 16 when the conflict erupted, Andreas remembers leaving everything when the Turkish army invaded. All of this used to be ours. Now we're left with just this, which is about one and a half hectares. We are filled with nothing but bitterness. What, what else can you feel? It was only the presence of a British army base that stopped the Turks advancing further and seizing the rest of Andreas's family land. Today, Achna lies abandoned and empty. Andreas can only watch from the safety of the Greek south as Turkish soldiers stand guard on the roof of his church. 
It's a daily reminder of the rift that now divides Cyprus. A rift that pushes the question of national identity to the heart of everyone's lives. Cyprus is a small country. There are no Cypriot people. We are Greek. And now there are also Turks in Cyprus. But there's no such thing as a Cypriot national. From its earliest history, people have fought over Cyprus. Seafaring nations prized the island for its fertile land and strategic location. They came across the Mediterranean from Europe, Asia and Africa. Each raid forced the people of Cyprus to serve a new master. Nowhere is this turbulent history more evident than in the ancient city of Salamis. This deepwater port was the ideal entry point for invading forces. The Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Persians and the Romans all left their mark on Salamis. It's an archaeological treasure trove. 3,000 years of history lie buried here. Italian historian Professor Luca Zavagno has devoted much of his life trying to unearth its ancient secrets. Inside, there are archaeological opportunities and infinite dreams. There's an amphitheater to excavate not far from here. The town was enormous, a Pompeii of the Middle East. But the present-day conflict in Cyprus runs so deep that even ancient history has become a political issue. Because of its location in the Turkish north, archaeological excavations at Salamis are banned by an international embargo. It's hard to believe, and harder for Professor Zavagno to accept, that this city's incredible history cannot be unearthed. From the surface evidence alone, Professor Zavagno has been able to document a compelling history. Wave after wave of the great powers of the Mediterranean taking possession of this key entry point. There is much more to discover about these astonishing ruins. But for now, their story is frozen in time. Professor Zavagno wonders whether he'll ever be able to marvel at their full riches. Living here as a Byzantine expert is a tragedy. Personally, it's a struggle to overcome the sorrow that I feel every day, knowing what Salamis could potentially be in archaeological terms. So the standoff continues. The pain and frustration of modern Cyprus manifest here in Salamis an ancient city of unfulfilled Eastern promise. The divisions that have torn Cyprus apart go right to the heart of the island's capital. The Green Line runs through Nicosia, the last divided capital in the world. On the surface, it's a mix of ancient walls, traditional eateries, and busy streets. But you don't have to look far to find the scars of division. Machine gun posts stand empty but ready for action. Peepholes offer vantage points. Just a picture postcard today, but used in anger within living memory. Keeping the peace is a thousand strong UN armed force. A constant reminder that the conflict between Greek and Turkish Cypriots is unresolved. 
Each side flies its flags. The Turkish population can trace their roots back to the 16th century. It was the Ottomans who brought Islam to Cyprus. When they invaded in 1571, churches were ransacked or converted to mosques. By contrast, the southern half of Nicosia is home to the Christian Greek Cypriots. Many of those living here, like Harry Harry Lowe, came to the capital as refugees. Harry's hometown is now in the Turkish-occupied north. Before 1974, I was living with my family in the small town of Morfu. It was a beautiful place. And Morfu was built in a big garden surrounded by lemon, orange and tangerine trees. But Harry's idyll was to be shattered. Since the 1960s, tensions between the Greek and Turkish Cypriot communities had often erupted into violence. The invasion of the Turkish army in 1974 was a godsend for the harassed Turks. But for the 200,000 Greek Cypriots living in northern Cyprus, it was a disaster. Under an aggressive process of population exchange, Turkish Cypriots from the south were driven north. While Greek Cypriots, like Harry and his family, were exiled to the south, leaving behind their homes and livelihoods, they became refugees overnight. We left all our belongings. Everybody thought that we'd be coming back. So we left with just the basics for ourselves and our children. Today, Harry can only use the well-thumbed pages of photo albums to share the family heritage with a new generation. For me, these pictures are a treasure. If I didn't have these photos, how else could I show my grandchildren the life we had back then in Morfu? Four decades after fleeing, the pain of exile hasn't diminished. It's the land of my ancestors, the land of my parents, my grandparents. Of course I miss it, and of course I want it back. Their old house in Morfu is less than 40 kilometers away. The prospect of never being able to return is heartbreaking for Harry. It calls to mind all that's been lost in the conflict. Nobody can believe this. Nobody can understand this unless they lived it. No one can understand unless they themselves are refugees, unless they lost loved ones in the war and are still waiting for them to return. More than 2,000 people are officially registered as missing in the conflict. Political efforts to put an end to the conflict are also unresolved. Greek Cypriot presidents, from the iconic Archbishop Makarios in the 1970s to the more modern leaders, have failed to find a way forward. The result for Cyprus is segregation. Two peoples living on opposite sides of a border, isolated by their differences. Today, with tensions at a relatively low ebb, the crossings in central Nicosia are open to pedestrians. Traffic can cross the border between the north and south. But for trade, the Green Line is a real barrier. 
It acts as a brake on the economic development of the whole island. The Greek South, with its membership of the European community, is able to trade freely with the rest of the world. But it's much tougher to sell to the North. For businesses there, the effects are much worse. The Turkish Cypriot Republic is only recognized by Turkey and can only trade through Turkey. It's a huge disadvantage for entrepreneur Ursan Dala. Because our goods are subject to high customs charges, we can't compete. Because of this, we have to conduct our business within the borders of northern Cyprus. Since only Turkey recognizes northern Cyprus as an independent state, everything bought and sold here, food, textiles, retail goods, must come via Istanbul. Even the post has to pass through Turkey first. Marketing to the rest of Cyprus is just as problematic. Ursan has made repeated efforts to get his products onto retail shelves in the south. Even talks brokered by the United Nations have failed to get the goods moving. The reason, as I understand it, is that supermarkets in the south are not prepared to put any goods produced in the Turkish north on their shelves, as they believe it will provoke a reaction from their customers. Prejudice or patriotism? The attitude of retailers, coupled with the restrictions on international trade, leave this Turkish Cypriot businessman angry and frustrated. But the economic divisions are a sign of a much deeper divide, one that goes to the very soul of Cypriots. Their island is home to two major faiths, Orthodox Christianity and Sunni Islam. As tides of religious change have swept across Cyprus, what was once a sacred space for one faith has been appropriated by another. This was the Cathedral of St. Nicholas in Famagusta. Its Gothic architecture is typical of the churches of medieval Europe. But when the Ottomans took the city in 1571, they made this space their own. In keeping with Muslim tradition, they whitewashed the walls, removed the stained glass windows, and plastered over all the images of the human form. By contrast, Greek Orthodox churches are elaborately decorated and highly ornate. Inside, vivid icons of the saints, the Virgin Mary and Christ cover the walls. The Orthodox religion is central to Greek Cypriot national identity. In the foothills, the village of Peristorona is preparing to celebrate Easter, the most important festival in the Orthodox calendar. For the older villagers, the Saturday of Holy Week is a quiet day of reflection and relaxation. <laughs> but for the young men, this is no time to switch off. The night before Easter calls for maximum vigilance. Weeks of painstaking effort are at risk. Mikalis Saba and his friends have constructed the village's Easter bonfire. 
It's taken weeks to build, and its size is a matter of community pride, as well as a source of rivalry with neighboring villages. But despite its ramshackle appearance, there's no doubt it has genuine religious significance. As you can see, on top of the bonfire, there is an effigy of Judas, who betrayed Jesus. To show that we condemn him, we burn his effigy every year. Orthodox traditions like these permeate rural life in this part of the island. At the family home, Michaelis's mother Maria is also busy, preparing food for the Easter celebrations. It's a tradition she's determined to pass on to the next generation. Just as my grandmother and my mother taught me, I'm trying to teach my daughters, so when they have families of their own, they'll be able to make their own Easter preparations. After weeks of eating unleavened bread, loaves are again baked with yeast to symbolize Christ's rising from the dead. Religion is not just for Easter in the Savar family home. Their whole house is decorated with religious pictures, the icons, which is such a distinctive part of Orthodox practice. But tonight, for the most important occasion in the Orthodox Christian year, the Savar family will worship at the local church. The tolling of the bells calls the whole community together. Some of the older villagers prepare by kissing religious icons and relics. It's a sign of honor and respect. The Sava family, like their friends and neighbors, arrive in their best clothes. The liturgy dramatizes the events of the very first Easter, when Christians believe Jesus rose from the dead. Greek Orthodox Christians have been celebrating this way since the 9th century. Just before midnight, all the lights are extinguished as the faithful wait for the moment of Christ's resurrection. This is the darkest moment of the whole church year. The sense of anticipation is very real. At the stroke of 12, the priest emerges. He proclaims, come and take the light. Villagers share the symbolic light of Christ. The procession outside represents the journey of Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, to his tomb on the first Easter morning. Echoing the women's astonishment at the empty tomb, the priest proclaims to the faithful, Christos Anesti, Christ has arisen. And the congregation reply, Alithos Anesti, truly he has arisen. church, the young men finally get to see their weeks of work go up in smoke. Michaelis stands with his father. Easter is about family as well as sacred ritual. Scenes like this are repeated across the Greek Cypriot south. It's a tradition they'll seek to protect, whatever the future of their divided island. Amen. 
as the Saba family say their goodbyes, they've one more tradition to observe. If they can keep their holy flame alight all the way home, they will enjoy a bountiful year. But there is one passion that unites Orthodox Christians with their Muslim neighbors, a deep love of their landscape. And there's one place where this is especially true, the Karpaz Peninsula. Known as the Panhandle, this extension of land juts out for more than 80 kilometers from the Turkish-dominated northeast of the island. Relatively untouched by the divisions that scar the rest of Cyprus, the Karpaz is one of the most unspoiled places in the whole of the Mediterranean. It's also home to a unique community. Greeks and Turks have always lived side by side in the village of Dip Karpaz. The upheavals of 1974 didn't change that. When the Karpaz Peninsula was cut off by Turkish troops during the invasion, the Greek Orthodox inhabitants couldn't flee south. And they've stayed here under the Turkish administration ever since. Today, the village's church welcomes the Orthodox faithful just across the main square from the mosque, and it's called to prayer. The Greek coffee shop looks across the street to its Turkish neighbor. They're used indiscriminately by both groups. <laughs> Further along the coast is an even more extraordinary example of religious and cultural harmony. This crumbling monastery was once known across the world as the Lourdes of Cyprus for its miraculous healing powers. Dedicated to St. Andrew after he performed a miracle here, it's a cherished holy place for both Greek and Turkish Cypriots. Pilgrims of all faiths come here to pray side by side. Tomata, prayer offerings to the saint are left in gratitude for a prayer answered or as a reminder that the sick are in need of healing. This is holy ground. But it's no miracle that the surrounding countryside is so fertile. Underneath the panhandle, there are bountiful reserves of subterranean water. This keeps the Karpaz lush and green through the hot summer months, when the rest of the island is baked dry. The region is rich in tobacco, fruit and olives, and has a long agricultural tradition. It was the lure of the landscape and the promise of a simple life that drew Turkish Cypriot Ismail Jamai and his wife Lois back to the Karpaz after long careers abroad. I'm a Cypriot, actually. That's why I came back. We also returned for the children to raise them in a nicer environment. We brought them here so that they can grow up bicultural and bilingual. Ismail grew up near the village of Bukunuk. He remembered it as a place of mixed cultures, 
Greek and Turkish side by side. But when Lois arrived here in 1986 and began to immerse herself in the culture, she was dismayed to discover the truth. The Greek villagers had been forced out. After 1974, Greek Cypriots didn't want to leave the village. It's a nice village, they said. We didn't do anything. We friends with Turks. But the Turkish military forced them out. Sixteen Greek villagers were killed in the upheavals. The bloody history is never far from people's minds. Day after day, we talk about politics. Day after day, we are confronted by the Cypriot problem. When old people talk, they say, it was like this before 1974, it was like that before 1974. They're still hopeful. They want their old life back. To help Bukunuk move on, Lois and Ismail have led a campaign to make the community a self-sustaining eco-village. They recycle rainwater, use solar panels, and press their own olive oil in the time-honored way. This is a visionary couple leading their own revolution in Cyprus. It's a cultural revolution rooted in everyday life. For Lois, this means embracing traditional ways of living, cooking using only natural ingredients and methods. Ismail has revived the craft of carving, using olive wood, which would otherwise be left to rot. In ecotourism, culture, traditions, and nature are important. If we promote these, I believe we'll be strengthening identity. A committed couple, a few simple steps, one small village getting behind them. These may be the stirrings of a grassroots movement towards change. Back in the divided capital of Nicosia, the barriers to progress haven't shifted. But even here, there are signs of people reaching out to bridge the gap. And it's happening on the no-man's land designed to keep the two sides apart. Marine engineer George Spiru believes real reconciliation between Greeks and Turks may be possible. In 1997, he co-founded the Bicommunal Choir for Peace. It's a 50-strong group of Greek and Turkish Cypriots. They rehearse here at the Ledra Palace Hotel, symbolically situated in the UN buffer zone between North and South. It was here that the UN administered the exchange of prisoners between the two communities in 1974. Now, people come of their own free will to meet and voice their hopes for a different future. The purpose of the choir was to unite the two communities by means of their common cultural values and to use music to spread the message of love, peace and togetherness. George was born in the south to Greek Cypriot parents during a turbulent period of intercommunal riots. He'd never even spoken to a Turkish Cypriot until he was 38 years old. What inspired me was my curiosity to meet my compatriots. 
to find out who these people are, what do they look like, what do they say, what ideas do they have, what are they thinking. George's quest for harmony struck a chord on both sides of the community. These are singers with a common vision of dual culture, where language, customs and traditions can be shared, even if it takes a really special effort. Songs from both cultures are featured, and the choir is led by two conductors, one from each tradition. We try to teach our languages to each other. This is very important, and the audience sees this, sees the efforts of one community singing in the language of the other. The joy and peace our members share is projected to the audience. Tonight the choir have come to the village of Athienu, a small Greek Cypriot enclave surrounded by Turkish-held land. The concert commemorates the lives of two friends, a Greek Cypriot and a Turkish Cypriot who were assassinated because of their work for peace between the two communities. To spread their message of harmony wider, the choir must strain to be heard against the clamor of division and prejudice that's gone on for so long. Of course, it's the biggest problem. It's something we think of almost every day and have done so for 36 years. It's like an open wound. And it's a shame because it's a very beautiful island. And to be divided with half over there and half over here, this separation is a real shame. All of us, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots together, could make Cyprus a paradise. Wearing white to symbolize peace, the choir's finale is an emotional plea. Written by friends from either side of Cyprus, my own country laments the heartbreak of their broken island. The lyrics lay bare the dilemma that every Cypriot faces. They say that everyone should love his country. This is what my father always says. But my own country has been divided into two parts. Which should I love? The question echoes from one end of Cyprus to the other. All over this island, north and south, Muslim and Orthodox, Turkish and Greek. There are people who long for a time when the love of one's country no longer means choosing between one side and another. Their voices are being raised, but their waiting is not over yet.